So I feel like there should be like these flashing lights warning everybody, Maletta is about to try to tell a joke. I'm notoriously bad at that, but I want to let you know that I spent two hours yesterday on the internet searching for a clean joke <laughs> that I could tell. And this is unfortunately what I came up with, okay? So, a local priest and a Protestant pastor stood by the side of the road holding up a sign that said, the end is near. Turn yourself around before it's too late. And they planned to hold that sign up each time a car drove by. First car comes by, they hold up the sign. The guy sticks out his head and yells, leave us alone, you religious freaks. A moment or two later, there was a screech and then a big splash. And one of the clergymen said to the other, do you think maybe we should have a sign that just says, the bridge is out? <laughs> How do you kiss someone at the end of the world? Apocalypse. <laughs> this, this one's even worse. What do you call it when pigs cause the end of the world? A porkalypse. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was hoping someone would do that. I wanted to start with a little humor today because we're at the end of the ordinary time and as Advent draws near, the theme of this time of year is on the second coming of Christ at the end of the world. The end of the world, Armageddon, doomsday, call it what you want. Humanity has been anticipating and thinking about the end of life as we know it from the very beginning. But the thought of the end seldom brings feelings of joy or excitement. Typically, it strikes fear in our hearts. And where our thoughts go, so too does the culture, Nostradamus, the Mayans, Y2K, and countless movies about the end of the world have all somehow contributed to that fear. Or maybe, I don't know, could it be possibly that people's fear is because they don't actually have as much control as they would like? Because when it comes to the end, none of us have any control. But to set the record straight, we hear in our gospel today the, that only the Father knows when the end of the world to come. No one else, not in the angels, the Holy Spirit, or Jesus himself, only the Father knows. I think most of us try not to think about it, right? Or if we think about it, we just hope that we won't be here when it happens. Amen? Okay, But during this time in our liturgical season, we're asked to stop pretending that it won't happen and prepare our souls accordingly. And when you think about it, how things will end or when things will end, uh, it's hard not to be a little afraid. And if you think about it, not just in a global sense of the end of the world, but in a more, on a more personal level, then we're tempted to be even more anxious. I, I mean, if you're my age or older, you're basically playing Russian roulette at this point. It's either going to be some form of cancer or heart disease. Something's going to get you, right? You, you know it's going to come, whether you like it or not. Sooner or later, as hard as it is to hear this, we're all going to die, and so will this world. Sobering realities as we close out the liturgical calendar. In today's gospel, Mark tells us that, after, that in those days after the tribulation, this refers to the general falling away from the faith by many Christians due to believing in false ideologies and replacing God, the God, with puny, small-case gods that the culture puts before us. Well, today, more than ever, you don't have to be a rocket science to know 
that fewer people worship God today than ever before. And instead of worshiping God, they hold on to like a kaleidoscope of inconsistent philosophies. And without doubt, most of us, even some of us here, if not most of us here, spend more time, more energy, and more of our resources in pursuing other gods, small case, than we do of the God of the universe. Amen? According to Mark 13, verse 19, followers of Christ will face persecution and be hauled into court because of their faith. This month, a British man was convicted of criminal charges for praying silently near an abortion clinic. The man, Adam Smith Connor, did not attempt to harass, intimidate, or interact in any way with those entering the, the clinic. Instead, he wordlessly prayed with his head bowed slightly. He wasn't even on clinic property, but he was arrested and convicted and sentenced because of that silent prayer. So in Great Britain, even your thoughts can be against the law if it goes against the way culture is going. In our own country, this past year in Massachusetts, a woman named Par Paulette Harlow, 75-year-old grandmother, was involved in a peaceful protest at, at an abortion clinic, and she was arrested. She was put on trial. She was given two years in prison. And what's even worse is the, as the judge was sentencing her, she lamented the fact that the sentence couldn't be longer, but she added, I hope you die while you're in prison. In the book of Revelation, chapter 16, 18 through 29, we read that the end of the world will occur in the midst of natural disasters and the greatest earthquake that's ever been recorded. The climate's changing. I know some of you don't like it when I say that, but the climate is changing. We've seen some of the worst natural disasters over the past decade, destroying communities and even nations. Matthew 24, verse 7 tells us, there will be wars as nations fight against nations. I did a Google search yesterday, just curious. Since I've been born in 1953, how many years since 1953 to the current time has there been a, a military conflict or a war going on in the United States? You know what the answer is? Every single year of my life, 71 years, there's been some kind of military conflict or outright war. Look at what's going on in the Middle East right now, Russia and Ukraine. Not to mention North Korea and China's threat to world peace. Scripture warns us that there will be persecutions aimed at the church itself. Uh, according to the Family Research Council, hostility and violence against churches in America, not counting the countless episodes throughout the world, like in Africa where people were locked in their church for worship and they burnt it to the ground because they were Christian. Not counting all that, here in the United States, we have reached an all-time high of violence towards churches, 430 incidents in 2023. That's a double the number that we had in 2022, and that is 800, 800 percent more than we had since 2018. An average of 39 attacks a month on Catholic and Christian churches. In Canada, 33 churches have been burnt to the ground in the past few years. Not one single conviction. Many of those 33 churches have been designated as arson, but no one's been arrested. In Matthew 24, verse 15, again we read about the general tribulation where he tells us that when it comes, we should basically run for our lives. If you're on the rooftop, don't go down and get anything. If you're in the field, don't go back home and get anything. If when the tribulation comes, you basically run for your life. In Daniel chapter 7, 24 through 26, in Matthew 
chapter 24, verse 24, in 2 Thessalonians, in chapter 2, verses 3 through 12, in 2 John 7 and Revelation 13 through 10, we read about the Antichrist. The Antichrist is supposed to be a character who will come and bring a godless utopian system to the world where anyone who disagrees will be annihilated, will be ostracized, will be canceled. Now, as far as I know, other than each political party accusing each other's presidential candidate as being the Antichrist, no credible Antichrist has emerged. However, if you look at the European Union, you can easily identify a movement to create a godless utopia and the subsequent persecutions and martyrdom for those who don't join in, as is outlined in Matthew chapter 24, 9 through 10. But if you think there is no good news in this homily, then you need to read the last verse of Matthew 24, 13, which was read today, where he promises that those who persevere will be saved. The Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches us that when Jesus returns at the end of the world, there will be a last judgment. All who were ever conceived or lived during the history of the world will be assembled. And according to our first reading from the prophet Daniel, Quote, some shall live forever, uh, forever, others shall be in everlasting horror and disgrace. We have a choice. Our God is good. We can decide what group we'll be in. And before you go into a panic mode, remember, we are not privileged to know when the end will come. Only the Father knows. So, listen carefully. Don't worry about what you don't know. Can we say that together? Don't worry about what you don't know. Look, for the Jews, the world seemed to end in 70 AD when the temp Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. For Christianity in 410, when the Vandals came down and sacked Rome, it looked like the end of the world. In 1325, where between 30 and 50 percent of the European population died from the Black Plague, that seemed like the end of the world. Or when the Nazis killed 11 million people during the Holocaust, not to mention the 6 million that Stalin killed of his own countrymen. Or when President Andrew Jackson set a policy to relocate Native Americans between 1830 and 1850, about 100 thousand American Indians living between Michigan, Louisiana, and Florida were forced to move west, the Trail of Tears. Many were treated brutally. Thousands died in the process, not to mention our national disgrace of slavery. In our lifetimes, even in our lifetimes, we have witnessed much violence. Remember 9-11? We thought it could never happen to us, and it did. What about just recently the COVID crisis that scared the wits out of many of us? We thought the world was ending. In all those cases, in each and every one of those cases, one world ended, but another world began. That's the beauty of our existence. We can adapt. We can change. We, we, we can grow. The purpose of the focus on the end of the world isn't just to remind us that we live in a temporal world, and it certainly isn't to terrorize us or depress us. The church wants us to realize that as we approach the great feast of the nativity, we can do better. We can take stock of our lives. We can repent, and we can grow. As a human race, we have made many mistakes which have led to painful consequences. But I think that's also true of us as individuals in our personal lives. We are not always what we could be, and we are not always what God calls us to be. And the church wants to remind us that our final destination is not a bigger home or a fancier car 
or a larger portfolio, or even the goodwill of other people towards us. No, for those who trust and who live our lives according to the final destination of eternity, life is different. We need to live, make our choices in the context of eternity and stop thinking just in terms of one dimension of the life we live. If we do and we hold on to our faith, it won't matter when it takes place because we'll be ready. We'll be prepared. We'll have the Lord in our lives. And that's all that matters. Let the church say. Amen. Just remember.